Okay. Um, I am very happy to introduce Dr. Christopher Broda, a cardiologist who's joining us from Texas Children's Hospital. I think this is going to be the perfect follow-up to Dr. Shidlow's talk because Dr. Broda is going to focus on transitioning from pediatric to adult care. Thank you very much. And I just want to uh, thank the organizers for asking me to give this talk. It's a real honor and privilege. And um, I think the mission of the Heterotaxy Connection is amazing. And um, everything you do is um, just much appreciated by the providers as well as I'm sure the families. So let me know if I'm not speaking loud enough and we'll, uh, I'll increase the volume. Um, but uh, I wanted my, the, the title of my talk is Becoming an Adult with Heterotaxy Syndrome, Successes and Challenges. And so um, let me just do this real quick. These are my disclosures. So a brief introduction um, to me and sort of where I work is the, uh, I'm an adult congenital heart uh, cardiologist in Houston, Texas. And I work at the Texas Medical Center, um, which is, uh, you know, um, one of the biggest medical centers. And I work at Texas Children's Hospital and Texas Children's Hospital recently, is this okay for audio? Is any feedback, is it okay? Is, um, has been recently paying more attention to our adult congenital heart patients and has actually built a, a floor for ACHD patients um, within the children's hospital. So uh, we have an inpatient side and an outpatient side. So if somebody were to get sick, an adult were to get sick, they'd come to the children's hospital, a small uh, adult hospital and a large children's hospital, if you will. And then on the outpatient side, we have exam rooms. There's less SpongeBob in our exam rooms upstairs, but uh, still okay, generally speaking. And um, echocardiography, uh, diagnostics, everything you need. We actually have a cardiac rehab facility, family lounge, um, and uh, equipment rooms, and a whole bunch of nice dedicated spaces for ACHD uh, patients. And I'm part of a large team. This is really sort of the um, sort of the cardiology medical team, but we also have um, many other sort of adult providers who um, help with our patients. Um, and uh, within our team, I have specialized into advanced heart failure. We're lucky that we have a large ACHD group and we have the ability to subspecialize even within adult congenital heart disease, which is a subspecialty in and of itself. Um, and my specialty is advanced heart failure. And so, but how did we get here? So we really owe... Um, and I, you know, I where I where we are today in my uh, and what I do for a living um, to the pioneers um, for the treatment of congenital heart disease. And here you see this is, you know, for right uh, often uh, thought of as one of the first heart surgeries. You see Dr. Um, Blaylock, Dr. Tossig, and uh, Dr. Vivian Thomas, who sort of came up with the uh, Blaylock, Tossig, Thomas shunt. And um, this uh, procedure was performed in um, the 1940s, and this was the shunt that um, uh, uh, Dr. Shidlow was mentioning earlier that helps provide pulmonary blood flow if you can't get blood flow to your lungs um, because you have a congenital heart defect. Um, actually, in this photo, Dr. Um, Denton Cooley is at the foot of the bed. Dr. Cooley was the founder of the Texas Heart Institute, and we have an affiliation with them. Other pioneers that are really important, um, we have very many uh, people who con uh, have contributed to the care of congenital heart disease, but um, doctor, definitely uh, 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 Maude Abbott was uh, instrumental and really the uh, her descriptions of congenital heart disease are the foundation of our field. Um, we wouldn't be where we are today without the contributions of um, uh, Dr. John Gibbon, who um, pioneered the heart-lung machine, enabling uh, complex repair uh, or repair of complex congenital heart disease. And then um, Dr. Francis Fontan, who um, uh, also sort of uh, pioneered uh, a life-extending procedure, which many single ventricle uh, patients uh, benefit from. Um, and these innovations um, have improved survival, and now we have uh, uh, people like me who take care of adults with congenital heart disease. Um, the prevalence of adults with congenital heart disease is growing because of the success of our um, pediatric colleagues and congenital heart surgeons, and 
Um, improvement uh, to, uh, in survival to adulthood is uh, improving even with the most complex heart disease. So you can see over time, um, uh, the striking improvement um, in the survival of patients with complex congenital heart disease. Um, historically, and even today, we still have difficult uh, difficulties with um, patients with uh, very complex heart disease, and often those are patients with heterotaxy syndromes or isomerisms, um, and, and they uh, have been uh, 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 historically uh, nearly universally fatal in childhood, but uh, through subspecialized care, um, we've been able to improve survival outcomes, uh, and and, um, and I'm seeing more um, young patients with heterotaxy syndromes in my clinic as we uh, um, uh, as we um, um, receive them from our pediatric colleagues. Um, but you know there are challenges uh, for adults in general, and also folks who have heterotaxy syndrome will also face these challenges. So, you know, we may have not thought of adult related issues, including like job and education, um, pregnancy and family planning, and assuming the responsibility of management for um, our health, uh, uh, health management. Really, it's the patient who's their own best advocate. Um, and so, um, so then we think about the idea of transitioning from the pediatric uh, providers to the adult providers. And you know we know that cardiac um, issues persist and can also, uh, often worsen in, in adulthood. Um, you know, like very rarely is a uh, congenital heart defect cured uh, with surgery. So the transition to adult providers includes um, the introduction of the concept of, um, you know, you're growing up and uh, you'll be um, transitioning to the adult congenital cardiologist. And some of our recommendations include introducing that idea as early as age 12 to 14, which seems kind of young, but that's where um, probably it's a good idea to just plant that seed that that's going to happen. Um, and then the guidance of parents is instrumental uh, and uh, helping um, somebody with congenital heart disease understand their heart disease. You know, and, and uh, in high school, you're like, man, like biology is tough, you know, and, and we're expecting to know what uh, heterotaxy syndrome with isomerism is. But, you know, it's a process and we, and we get there with um, input from parents and with our providers as well. Um, then there's the assessment of sort of the needs and progress of within the family and a social dynamic, um, counseling and education along the way. Um, and really we should be developing a working uh, and working with a transition plan. So it's not just a surprise um, for, for folks. Um, and then things that can also help is having the ACHD cardiologist come meet, uh, uh, meet the patient with congenital heart disease before they transition. And then also perhaps um, introducing to uh, a peer who is older, who has made that transition successfully to the uh, adult congenital provider. And then after the transfer of care, we'll be continu continuing to monitor the patient closely to make sure we um, sort of uh, uh, are there to support them if, if they need us. Um, and subspecialty care matters. I think Dr. Shidlow's talk sort of like exemplifies that. Really, you want to have um, you want to have a cardiologist for sure when you come uh, with you have uh, adult congenital heart disease, but um, it really matters, especially if you have complex, uh, moderate or complex congenital heart defects. Having uh, uh, a subspecialty cardiologist, like an ACHD cardiologist, uh, can be really helpful. Maybe sometimes the adult cardiologist who's traditionally trained might not completely understand sort of the nuances of the congenital heart disease. Um, and, you know, we're sort of working on getting more um, folks who are ACHD trained, adult congenital heart trained. Um, there are a lot of adult uh, cardiologists and um, a good number of pediatric cardiologists, but the number of board certified adult congenital heart doctors is quite low at less than 500. And so when we sort of like balance to see how many um, providers are there for patients, the uh, adult cardiologist has the number I've heard as low as 800 patients per adult cardiologist, and probably this is the highest estimate of 2,500 patients per cardiologist. Um, and then the pediatric cardio our pediatric cardiology colleagues probably have somewhere in the ballpark of 
300 patients per uh, pediatric cardiologist. But if you take what we assume is the number of ACHD patients, um, we probably have over uh, like uh, 3,500 ACHD patients per ACHD provider. So we really have a lot of work to do um, with uh, having more folks trained in adult congenital heart disease. And so that also can, um, just having the lack of ACHD providers can be a barrier um, for a successful transition. And most ACHD care is provided in um, high population density areas. And you can see this leaves big gaps. One of my colleagues published this, uh, this map and as you can see sort of the driving distances um, uh, that can be pretty substantial to get to an ACHD center. So oftentimes we're thinking of ways to work with um, local providers to help with um, um, sort of management and, and seeing our patients um, in a way that makes sense and that's, uh, that, that, we can, uh, uh, that we can facilitate because we know it's not easy to, to drive these long distances. However, things are getting better and the Adult Congenital Heart Association is a very nice group um, for sort of like uh, from patients, uh, for patients and are providing um, actually accreditation on different levels for centers. And so different centers will have sort of a different level of accreditation of, um, um, but um, more and more centers are going and getting this accreditation and you can actually find where your ACHD, cardio the ACHD cardiologist closest to you um, by going to this website, the website's down there in the corner. And that'll be achaheart.org. So, if, you know, assuming we're at least close enough to an ACHD cardiologist or another cardiologist and make the successful transition or have the opportunity to do so, you know, we still have troubles um, often and there's often gaps in care. And unfortunately, it seems like folks with the most complex heart disease are the folks who are most likely to have gaps in care. And so, but why is that? What is the sort of underpinning of this? And so there's been a lot of thought um, about this, and we know that for, uh, there's several different domains, and overall, like so, so we know that social determinants of health is, really affects um, care in a lot of ways, and so education. We know um, congenital heart survivors might be less likely to obtain a college degree, and more likely to have learning disabilities, so that can provide a barrier. There's economic stability barriers. Um, we know that ACHE survivors are less likely to be employed and um, are more likely to need to take time off from medical care and the environment. Um, living remotely from a center, sort of we talked about that. Um, the medical system is very complex and it's not easy to navigate in all cases, particularly if you have um, sort of a uh, really complex, um, not often seen um, medical issue. Um, so the healthcare system itself can provide barriers and we'll sort of talk about that in a little bit. And um, you know the social and community context, you know, having peer support there, family support, organizations like Heterotaxi Connection, organizations like the Adult Congenital Heart Association, um, those uh, uh, are there to, that we can sort of utilize and help get patients to transition successfully. And then we also have these, you know, underlying underpinnings of our society, you know, structural and institutional racism, implicit bias, lapses in care, inadequate, inadequate health, co health coverage can all contribute to poor transition. And so when we talk to um, a, a adult congenital heart patients um, and we find what is the reason they might have difficulty transitioning to an adult congenital provider, you know, the most common reason is they say, well, I felt well, no matter what their lesion complexity. I feel good, I don't really need to go see the cardiologist, it's all good. Mm -hmm. um, but then another really important thing is, and particularly for folks with moderate to severe or like complex congenital heart disease is the um, insurance issue. And the insurance issue certainly isn't new. And there's this call to arms and published in, uh, 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 in pediatrics in 1977 and then uh, statements after statements, and we know that insurance is definitely can be difficult to um, obtain. We usually, you know, in our health 
uh, care system. Insurance is uh, typically needed to maintain connection to the to to the system, and most of the time, insurance comes with a job that provides insurance. Not everybody in this country just gets insurance just because. There's often a critical transition period between ages 18 and 20, where um, pediatric patients, once they age, uh, reach this age, are no longer eligible for Medicaid. Um, and so prior to the Affordable Care Act, it was virtually impossible for ACHD patients to obtain insurance. I actually have a congenital heart defect, and I was in medical school trying to get insurance. And I was like, uh, can I, like, I just need to get insurance, you know, just let me buy some. Uh, and they're like, well, we can't do that, you know. Uh, so that at least uh, the Affordable Care Act was a major step forward, but still we have barriers to get insurance. Um, and obtaining, so, and then sort of the fallback would be if we can get social security disability insurance for our patients, but this is often extremely challenging. There's sort of limited criteria to meet disability uh, uh, for disability for congenital heart disease. You have to have severe cyanosis, pulmonary hypertension, which really is pulmonary arterial hypertension. And then um, the severity of heart failure and arrhythmia burden are quite uh, extensive. And uh, often I find that our uh, adult congenital heart patients don't have a similar reserve to our, um, to our patients with structurally normal hearts who have heart failure and arrhythmia burden. I do have one patient who spent three, have, uh, there's no consideration for heterotaxy in this. There's no consideration for Fontan uh, for disability insurance. Some of my patients who don't make traditional criteria can hire a lawyer. I've heard patients go through multi-year process, uh, come in front of a judge and then get disability that way. But, you know, certainly um, difficult to access. So with all of those difficulties, I do want to talk about a um, uh, one of my patients who has had a ter terrific transition, but this is also sort of uh, a story of how things have changed over time as well. So Jam was born with a heterotaxy syndrome, uh, likely polysplenia left isomerism, um, and then sort of complex defects, situs inversus, dextrocardia, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, ventricular inversion, um, VSD, transposition, pulmonary atresia. So it depends on sort of which institution you go to exactly which, like the vernacular of the diagnosis. Um, so my boss would probably be upset with some of the things I said um, coming from where I am, but sort of, uh, anyway, that's the sort of insight. And so after birth, his parents were told he would not survive infancy. He received a BTT shunt at three months of age and sort of, uh, 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 you know, um, with uh, Dr. Shibzo, we sort of know about what the BTT shunt is. This was the classic or it's actually just a turn down of the artery itself rather than um, rather than a graft connecting the artery to the uh, to the pulmonary artery. And, you know, um, he was surviving, thriving, um, you know, but was growing progressively more cyanotic, more blue. So then at three years of age, he received another uh, or a second classic BTT shunt. Um, and then um, that lasted about three years, but again, he grew sort of more cyanotic, more blue, um, more short of breath with doing things. And so at age six, he received another central shunt. And then later at nine years of age, he received um, a superior cable pulmonary connection, a Glenn shunt. Um, so, you know, a more stable source of pulmonary blood flow, um, an SVC to the pulmonary artery. Um, and then finally, at 15 years of age, he received Fontan circulation completion. So none of the blood that went to the lungs was going through the heart. Um, he continued to follow with his pediatric cardiologist well into adulthood. His story is, is that really the ACHD cardiologists, um, he mentioned, it wasn't easy to provide uh, to find somebody with, con with congenital heart expertise who was an adult. And so he sort of bounced around um, different cardiologists saying, well, I'm not comfortable taking care of you as an adult. I know your congenital heart disease, or I'm comfortable taking care of you as an adult, but I don't understand what the heck, you know, heterotaxy syndrome is. So um, he, so 
he found that to be difficult, but still he um, persevered. And after high school, he got an undergraduate degree and got married. Um, he moved from Georgia, which is where he had many of his interventions, to Fort Worth, Texas. And while in Fort Worth, he went on to graduate school and the seminary and got a degree in theology. Um, he later moved outside of Corpus Christi, Texas, um, previously worked as a youth pastor, but now works for a life insurance company. And he sort of like says that and like, I'm not working in a life insurance company. I probably couldn't get life insurance. So he's kind of a funny guy sometimes. Um, and then he also let me provide a picture of him with his um, current wife and his three boys. So he continues to, so he's 40 years old, continues to follow closely with his primary care doctor. So we need our primary care doctor because we can have other things other than just our heart disease and certainly multi system with uh, folks who have heterotaxy syndrome. His ACHD cardiologist and also his hepatologist because he has Fontan circulation, very important. His medicines include uh, sacubitril valsartan, metoprolol, and rivaroxaban. And, you know, so this is a nice picture of him uh, sort of really thriving. Um, and, uh, you know, so it is possible, but it is a journey and can be a struggle to get there. So what do folks who have heterotaxy syndrome who survive to adulthood, what, it, what do they look like? What does a successful transition to an ACHD clinic look like? And unfortunately, the uh, uh, data uh, available for this are very sparse. In fact, I think the only, I'm not really sure, I think the only paper that exists is the one I published in, as a fellow um, at Texas Children's Hospital. And we uh, had 62 patients um, and the median age, this is a young group, median age was only 23 years old. So the um, sort of the racial and ethnic demographics were reflective of sort of the Houston area, uh, Texas. Um, it's important to note that, uh, you know, in the United States, about 33% of folks will have an undergraduate degree, will have a bachelor's degree, but 65% had a bachelor's degree in this cohort of patients showing you that how important it is to get uh, education so you can get a job that can give you insurance to get you in the clinic, okay? And then um, um, uh, the minority of patients did not complete high school. Um, most patients were either attending, the vast majority of patients were either uh, attending school or, um, or, uh, or had a job. Um, a fourth of patients were married and some patients had children, mostly the men. Um, and then, um, you know, a minority of patients did sort of like things you shouldn't do, like smoke, like tobacco products and or other drugs. Certainly, if there's a pediatric patient and they start doing those things, then they become our patient, even though they're still pediatric patients usually. And then another very important thing is that um, only 10% of the patients that we saw did not have insurance. And most likely that was because they were included in the study when they came to the hospital. You know, our hospital has uh, has a charity program that's very generous, but that's not a good long-term solution. Not all pro uh, hospitals will have that. And then sort of private insurance is sort of usually the most ideal because sometimes these other uh, marketplace insurances, you may not be accepted at certain institutions, um, certain places. So it, it's, it's a difficult journey and really like, um, I'm sort of harping a lot on the insurance thing, but like uh, you might, we often involve our social worker to try to help navigate that because that's a very complex, could probably have a whole day symposium just on sort of the difficulties navigating that. So, so becoming an adult, now we think about other things like family planning and pregnancy. And I wanted to um, discuss a case that we had about a patient who was 20 years old and she has uh, heterotaxy syndrome, sort of asplenia or right isomerism, single ventricle heart defect, <laughs> complex heart, uh, and ended up um, going down, getting a uh, sort of a single ventricle um, Fontan uh, palliation and um, presented to our cardiology clinic 14 weeks pregnant into her first pregnancy. She had been followed before, said, well, if you think about pregnant, becoming pregnant, why don't we you know, have a sit down chat about it? But didn't do that, uh, and uh, and uh, and you know presented to us with the uh, 14 weeks pregnancy, and but luckily you know our only medicines were sort of amoxicillin prophylaxis and bit and a baby aspirin, 
And um, overall, her heart was in pretty good health with only mild valve regurgitation and normal heart function and no significant history of arrhythmia burden. So, um, you know, she was followed closely by the maternal fetal medicine physicians and cardiology. We have sort of like a combined clinic for complex patients. And um, the pregnancy was progressed pretty unremarkably. Um, uh, there was a normal fetal echocardiogram. And um, she was admitted to the hospital, induced for labor at uh, 38 weeks, and uh, had a vacuum-assisted delivery, uh, uh, the healthy delivery of a healthy baby boy. So it's like, wow, it's pretty, went pretty smooth. It's pretty nice, but not quite. So she had a postpartum hemorrhage and then a fever. Started on antibiotics and brought to the uh, operating room for retained products. Uh, but lost a lot of blood, got about three liters of blood and received blood products like plasma, platelets, um, and um, had a brief stay in the ICU, uh, but uh, ended up doing okay and then getting discharged uh, soon after that and was seen one week later in clinic feeling well. So that was like a close call. <laughs> um, but actually, we still have the continued of the story. So then one week later, she presented to the ER with sharp chest pain, shortness of breath, elevated heart rate, and low saturations. Um, extensive workup, and we diagnosed pulmonary embolism. Um, and uh, she was started on anticoagulation and quickly taken to the cath lab for emergent uh, you know, thrombolysis, which means a breaking up of the blood clot. Um, so here is a catheter um, in the pulmonary artery. This is sort of uh, 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 sort of you'll see the angiogram looking at the chest field, and this is a catheter injecting dye, and really all the portions of the pulmonary artery should be filled with black dye, but you can see the portions that sort of are unfilled, um, and those that's where blood clot is. So it was all in actually in both pulmonary arteries and both lungs. Certainly, it could be life threatening to even folks without Fontan. So she received um, sort of a, a catheter-assisted thrombolysis with these special catheters called ECOS catheters um, that were placed. And basically what they do is they uh, put ultra, uh, sort of like ultrasonic waves to break up blood clot and also shoot out um, thrombolytic. And so um, thrombolysis was successful and actually she was discharged uh, from the hospital four days later and then put on anticoagulation and warfarin because she was breastfeeding. Um, and currently she's doing well. Um, couldn't get a picture from her yet, but hopefully in the future, um, but she's doing well with her five-year-old boy. And when I uh, spoke to her on the phone, she was like, hold on, I gotta, I'm got i like exercising at the gym. And so I was like, that's really good because one of the things that we think can probably help folks with Fontan the most out of my medicines or anything, it's probably exercise. So it's really sort of heartened to hear that. So um, talking about pregnancy and congenital heart disease, we know that pregnancy involves uh, significant changes in our uh, sort of cardiovascular um, uh, uh, physiology. We know that um, you have increased blood volume, increased heart rate. You know, the heart really has to do the work both to provide uh, blood flow and nutrients to mom, and then also the fetus. Um, and so we often tell our patients, it's like the heart, it's like you're running a marathon for nine months. Um, that's what the heart, work of the heart is like. And then labor also imparts very important changes, you know, elevations in heart rate, central venous pressure, um, cardiac output, um, fluid shifts, especially if you have a C-section. And so our cardiology societies have had, kind of come together and try to help us figure out who's going to be at most risk for having trouble during pregnancy. And you know, it's the folks with the most complex heart defects that have the most trouble with pregnancy, uh, even to the degree of, um, because you know, like uh, folks who have at-risk heart can be pushed over the edge into arrhythmia or heart failure. Um, some people who have a really bad disease, like really poor heart squeeze, really bad pulmonary arterial hypertension, and some other things really should not get pregnant. And so talking to your adult providers and having uh, uh, a thoughtful approach to family planning is really what we need to really what we need to instill in some of uh, some of our patients. Folks who have Fontana are at 
there's four risk categories, one being the least risk, four being the most risk. Anybody who has Fontan circulation is already at risk category three, okay? And then to put it in perspective, uh, we have European guidelines that will tell us if you have a Fontan circulation and you have some problems, probably you really shouldn't get pregnant. There's actually a class three recommendation, which is like a no-no uh, for uh, getting pregnant if you have a Fontan with a problematic circulation. So um, I wish I could tell you about what does pregnancy look like in folks with heterotaxy syndrome. To my knowledge, there really aren't any data for that. Um, so actually, we're going to try to look at our database and see what we have. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we do have some data for pregnancy and patients with Fontan circulation. We know there can be some challenges. We know that there's fetal complications. Um, up to 50% of pregnancies can result in miscarriage. And live births are um, often affected by prematurity and small for gestational age. In large cohorts of like studies of folks who have Fontan who've given birth, um, you know, um, uh, maternal death seems to be very rare. In um, some of the large studies, there were no uh, maternal deaths, but definitely you have to be looking out for heart failure, you know, shortness of breath, need for diuretic or other medicines to support the heart. And certainly arrhythmia can happen. And only a minority of patients have pulmonary embolism. Um, and so we can also sort of save questions to the end. And there might, there may or may not be some questions about this, but I sort of wanted to um, address another sort of important topic for our adults who have complex congenital heart disease, including heterotaxy syndromes, uh, sort of exemplified by a recent uh, a recent patient story. So we have um, patient RT who is born with heterotaxy syndrome. Uh, actually came to us with the diagnosis of right isomerism or asplenia. Turns out he has a spleen, and then I'm not actually entirely sure what his heterotax, how I'd classify it. Maybe we can chat and we can figure out how we would do. But um, so I'm not sure if he really is a right isomerism, but either way, he has a single ventricle heart defect who, um, uh, and he received the uh, Fontan circulation palliation. Um, and so he established care in our ACHD clinic about eight years ago, but as a lot of folks do, had difficulty with insurance intermittently following up with his pediatric cardiologist closer to him, uh, and then um, sort of came back to us more recently with heart failure symptoms. So he is a uh, you know, young guy, 27 years old, um, and his heart failure really was, sometimes heart failure is not really obvious to know how why it's happening or how to even classify it, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But his was pretty obvious. He has poor heart squeeze and, va and leaky valves. And so, you know, that leads to, you know, shortness of breath, can't do the things you used to be able to do, trouble breathing while laying flat, flu in the belly or legs. And so he sort of had worsening heart failure symptoms and uh, went to the hospital, his uh, local hospital, and they transferred him to our facility and we treated him with diuretics and medical therapy. But you know, it didn't really help, you know, very much. He came, he quickly came back and was needing IV medicines to help his heart squeeze, you know, like inotropes, but I know pressors. And so, you know, we did it at sort of an emergency evaluation for advanced heart failure therapies for him. Um, our surgeons, multiple surgeons who do a lot of complex <clears throat> congenital heart transplants thought that his anatomy was too complex to do a, safely do a heart transplant. So we uh, talked about a lot. Um, uh, left ventricular assist device this is the only thing on the market currently is a HeartMate 3. And um, so we talked about it as sort of like uh, a long-term heart failure therapy, um, which uh, this, this device can improve uh, heart failure symptoms. The drawback is that the Fontan circulation, Fontan circulation still remains. Um, and he accepted the offer and had a had an LVAD implant and really had a pretty unremarkable hospital course, which was nice. Um, he was discharged from the hospital after LVAD implant in less than a month. And here you can see him as he's leaving the hospital. And um, here's part of his medical team. Um, and really, when you talk to him, he says, Our, my symptoms are much better. Overall, I'm feeling good. Uh, walking much further, I'm able to go to the stores all the day, the gallery in, the, uh, in Houston, Texas, and he gets to enjoy uh, more time with his three boys. So, um, so we have more options for folks who have heart failure. 
Um, but we do know that the burden of failure in the ACHD population is significant. Uh, uh, patients who have simple congenital heart diseases, their life expectancy usually approaches that of the general population. Um, when we look at large cohorts of ACHD patients, and this is sort of, and I should also, you know, like mention that this is everything sort of shifting as our repairs have gotten better and better. Our subspecialized care for our pediatric patients has gotten better and better. So while these num these numbers sort of a little bit historical, even though they're newer studies, if that makes sense. Um, but the median age of death for the ACHD population in most contemporary co cohorts is about 50 years old. So not very old. And then for our complex patients with the very uh, difficult hearts, um, you know, they have substantial uh, risk for premature death. And a lot of our studies are between 30 and 40 years of age. Um, and we know that the reason for death is often the most common reason is heart failure. So what does heart failure look like for patients with uh, heterotaxy syndrome um, who are adults? Well, again, I think the only data we really have is this. I mean, there are some, there are some studies that look at um, a large database, um, but those go off diagnosis codes and it's hard to know exactly who you're looking at in those studies. But in, in our study, we saw that about 30% of patients had the diagnosis of heart failure. Um, and then the median age of heart failure-free survival was a young in the 30s. And by the time folks made it to the adult congenital heart clinic, already 10% of folks had heart failure. Um, even though there was a good number of patients who had this in the study at the time, only one patient received a left ventricular cyst device, an LVAD, and then um, that patient, uh, and then two other patients received a heart transplant, but we know that it's difficult um, sometimes and only one patient survived after their heart transplant. So why is this? So this would suggest that, you know, advanced heart failure therapies are underutilized uh, with, for our patients. Now, why could that be? Well, there's several different reasons. And one of the things that can provide difficulty to providers uh, and patients alike is what do heart failure patients look like? When we think of heart failure, think of uh, typical, typical, you know, structurally normal hearts with a heart attack, and it's pretty obvious, you know, um, short of uh, short of breath at rest, um, can't breathe while laying flat, flu in the belly, legs, stuff like this. But you know, a lot of times our ACHD patients, you know, by the time they present with symptoms, may already be in advanced stages of disease, leading to negative impact on outcome despite intervention or initiation of medicines. That's because folks accommodate to their circulation often. So they'll say, well. Doc, I feel fine. I can do everything I want to do. I'm like, okay, well, can you ride a bike? Well, I can't ride a bike. Are you crazy? No, I could never ride a bike. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not sure, you know, I would really put you in sort of like a, a NYHA class one, or which is like basically no symptom heart failure category, which is, but if somebody doesn't tell you they're having symptoms, that's the sort of category um, they go to. Making sort of assessment of heart failure and knowing when to start therapy is difficult. Another thing that complicates the picture is that things that are predictive in structurally normal hearts, like heart stretch markers, heart failure hormones, um, worsening uh, symptom burden, increase uh, uh, can uh, you know sometimes they're helpful and sometimes they're not as helpful and less predictive. And things as sort of like um, fundamental as heart squeeze don't always predict um, if somebody's going to have a heart failure event. Um, and so if somebody is diagnosed with heart failure, I should also mention we don't necessarily have a universal definition of circulatory failure or heart failure in the ACHD patients. Um, a lot of times we think about, well, how can medicines help them? Uh, we know that something called guideline-directed medical therapy, basically um, medicines that have been proven in trials in patients with structurally normal hearts who have heart failure, it's the foundation, it's the cornerstone of management of, of heart failure. And this is based on how the heart failure hormones are affecting the heart muscle. Um, uh, and so basically that's how, and a lot of how heart failure cardiologists understand the use of those medicines. We know that the heart failure hormones of the body are activated in ACHD patients with heart failure, but there's still a big controversy of whether or not medicines work for folks 
with adult congenital heart disease who have heart failure symptoms. It's no, it's like important to note that there's many modes of circulatory failure that might not be consistent with the typical heart failure for, you know, like typical hearts, like usually it's like poor heart squeeze. And as I mentioned before, not all patients who have failure have poor heart squeeze. So fundamentally they're, they're probably different. And then we also have some like, you know, some difficult studies that were done in some subpopulations that have not always shown efficacy, but you know, I, I personally have some problems sort of interpreting the usefulness of those data. Um, we also know that, so when we talk about heart failure and therapies, we always think about heart transplant, sort of the ultimate therapy. Um, it's been said that maybe 20, 10 to 20% of congenital heart patients will eventually need a heart or heart lung transplant. And we know that um, looking at a database, one of my colleagues published a paper looking at sort of the uh, a heart transplant database, and we see that about uh, 1,200 ACHC patients received a heart transplant um, in the last two decades, and about 3% of all heart transplants were for ACHC patients. Um, we have data to show that ACHC patients are more likely to die or worsen before obtaining a heart, um, but, you know, there was a change in the organ allocation system in 2018, and hopefully that uh, we, that definitely did address the wait time, and hopefully that's improved um, that problem a little bit. Um, one of the issues that we know that ACHD patients face in general for heart transplant is that the perioperative time is very dangerous for them uh, as compared to somebody who doesn't have a congenital heart defect. Um, so that's a very dangerous time and uh, they have a higher risk for death during the transplant itself, however, uh, after the transplant, you know, they have a long, longer term utility of the, don um, of the heart transplant and they survive longer than non-ACHD patients. So it's important for us not to um, get too disappointed in some of these results and we're working to make those results better because patients can really utilize heart transplants, especially if they have uh, adult congenital heart disease. When I'm talking about heart transplants, we also have to talk about, we also should talk about other um, advanced therapies that have been useful for patients and it are increasingly improved over time. And that's a durable ventricular assist device. And so I should also mention that not all heart failure modes or circulatory failure modes are going to be compatible with this device. Like this won't necessarily work for everybody. But um, it definitely can help folks who have poor heart squeeze, leaky valves, uh, and some other issues. Um, we know that LVADs, left ventricular assist device, are um, rarely uh, utilized for ACHD patients. Out of the database that sort of follows implants of these um, devices, less than 1% were received by ACHD patients, despite sort of when they're used in the typical fashion that you would usually use the device in, they have uh, uh, folks with ACHD have similar survival to non-ACHD. And we know that expert centers can achieve a, a greater than 90% survival to discharge after implant. Uh, we published a paper looking at sort of our outcomes in adult congenital heart disease and ventricular assist device use. And we saw that uh, uh, three of 16 of our patients had heterotaxy syndrome. So it's possible to use. Um, and so um, sort of talked about a whole lot of different important aspects of uh, care for adults and relevant for adults who have heterotaxy syndrome. Um, and so um, we are where we are because of the success of the pediatric cardiologists and congenital heart surgeons. Uh, improved survival. But as I mentioned before, you know, congenital heart disease is rarely cured. Um, we know that the transition from the pediatric cardiologist to the adult congenital heart provider is important. Sometimes folks can get lost in the shuffle. Um, and because um, people who have heterotaxy syndromes, a lot of times, you know, uh, have uh, substantial cardiac uh, uh, issues, uh, this transition period um, is very important and ensuring a, a good transition is is is, is is of really utmost importance. And I know I sort of talked about it a lot, but you know, securing insurance is really an essential goal of uh, transition because it's, um, 
it creates a lot of challenges if you don't have that. And then um, life can be fulfilling, um, but a medical partnership is most likely needed if you're an adult with uh, congenital heart disease, particularly if you have a complex heart defect, uh, a lot of folks who have heterotaxy syndrome might have. So with that, um, hopefully I'm not like too over on time. That's really all my slides, but I'm happy to take questions. And uh, as in the heterotaxy connection, as fierce advocates for um, the the system that all of our children have to go through um, over time, I, I kind of have the sense that in the next decade, um, folks like you are going to be feeling an even greater tidal wave of survivors <laughs> that need care. Um, what can we as families be saying or doing, or who should we be talking to, to promote a growth of um, adult CHD doctors? Um, is there something, I mean, even what, like, even if there's just a small step that we can take, I feel like, you know, everybody, if we can spread that word, it can, um, have a very strong trickling effect nationwide because it's very much needed. Thank you. Great question. Um, unfortunately not an easy answer. Um, but, uh, uh, certainly I think a lot of people are seeing, and like if you go to talks and you see like tidal wave of, you know, patients. And so what you say is very relevant because a lot of people have that feeling. Um, and so why is there sort of like a dearth of ACHD cardiologists? Well, it's probably because of it's multifactorial, but it's sort of a long training process. And, um, and, uh, and like, there's, different reasons for why are there not more of us essentially adult congenital heart uh, docs. But I think the things that could be most beneficial are joining organizations and being advocates with, for like heterotaxy connection, you know, talking to, um, uh, uh, you know, re relaying your feelings to like, uh, big medical bodies, like the, uh, um, uh, like American board of internal medicine or pediatrics, because ultimately they determine our training pathway. So currently to become an ACHD cardiologist, a preferred pathway would be, you know, you know, undergrad, four years medical school, four years med medicine pediatrics residency, three years of either adult cardiology or pediatric cardiology, and then a two-year adult congenital heart fellowship. So it's a lot. And, um, and if there could, if probably the main thing that we can improve upon is shortening the duration of the training pathway. So, but that's also up to us to advocate for ourselves as well. So um, we have a little bit more work to do on our part as well. I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, but um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Brody, thank you for your talk. Tom Saba from Michigan. So, um, well, I came in midway through and I was really disappointed I missed the beginning, but the second half was really spectacular. Sure, the first half was just as good. So what I learned from your talk is a lot about um, kind of post-operative and adult outcomes among children, among people with congenital heart disease. And what I'm not totally understanding is how much of these outcomes, you know, post-operative and pregnancy and kind of all general life outcomes are related to the heart disease and how much of those outcomes are related to every other kind of complex medical condition that people with heterotaxy are living with, like, you know, spleen issues and chronic infections and intestinal problems and lung problems. And well, we can go down the list, but um, I, I assume your studies kind of corrected or, or, or took into account some of those things. Um, and you might not have a great answer. I guess I'm just kind of throwing out a, a concern I have that we don't really, we can't really quantify how much of the outcomes are specifically related to one organ system or another. Can you comment on that? Thank you, Thank you for a great question. And, um, um, you know, I think probably I can't answer the question because there aren't data, like sort of, uh, there's hardly any data. There's sort of some, uh, uh, studies looking at registries from like the National Inpatient Sample and stuff that require like 
you know, diagnosis codes and try to figuring, figuring out if that relates or you know, like how that impacts outcomes for people with heterotaxy syndrome. But I'm not sure you're really capturing everybody who has heterotaxy syndrome or even what type of heterotaxy syndrome they truly have. And it's like I said, even for a patient who has an LVAD or like what type of heterotaxy syndrome do they have? You know, so like, I think using those large databases make, um, make it difficult. Um, and then, uh, there's really not a whole lot of data, maybe other than sort of the paper like we published, you know, a couple of years ago, at least in that cohort of patients. And I'm going to be very sort of like uh, uh, focus only on the congenital heart disease as a cardiologist. Um, and that group of patients, we didn't see too many other problems as far as like uh, bad infections and um, uh, pro- like lung problems, but they def- but folks definitely did have uh, other issues with like history, like, like a lot of stroke happened, but also a lot of arrhythmias and a lot of heart failure. So sort of all, that's uh, probably all inter- intertwined. So I don't really have a great answer to your question, but really it's because we lack the data and probably what we could do hopefully uh, is come up with like maybe a multi-institutional sort of um, endeavor to sort of look at our adult heterotaxy patients and kind of see, you know, not just what are the, people in Texas look like, what do more people look like? And then because within those big databases, you might perhaps get the patients who have sort of an incidental finding of like left isomerism, you know, come in, we're referred, they have an interrupted IBC, but really everything else is pretty good. Um, So um, uh, sort of a long answer, sort of the longer answer is, but the shorter answer really is there's no data to tell you one way or another, what the other organ systems, what their impact are like. So we have noticed that for pediatricians, the the cardiologist is the one who tends to take the lead and has offered suggestions as to what other subspecialty treatments related to heterotaxy receive. You see this with adults, or does this tend to change? And the specialties tend to only stay within their specialty. So... <clears throat> We have a lot of work to do uh, on the adult side. I mean, you know, I think that the pediatric system is mind boggling. Go to the adult system. Like you can get really lost really quickly. And so, and then depending on your system, there may or may not be very much communication with your cardiologist to the other other subspecialists. Um, So really probably what are some practical the practical answer to this is to find adult cardio, adult congenital cardiologist who knows a lot about heterotaxy syndrome. And there's like, you know, not that many folks who do that, but that's probably the most practical thing because um, finding a subspecial, a, a multidisciplinary clinic for adults with congenital heart disease who have heterotaxy syndrome is going to be a challenge. I think we'll probably end up getting there, but, um, but you know, the, the, the Boston program is sort of unique. Um, And we have a lot of big, good children's hospitals around too that don't necessarily have specific heterotaxy uh, program. So um, I feel like I'm I'm giving like a lot of answers, but like that, you know, that that really think it's like a lot of work we still have to do. We're sort of in the infancy of things, if you will. As I mentioned, like the cohort of patients we described really was young in the early 20s. And so um, that's just, uh, uh, you know, uh, that just shows us that, you know, our, the terrific transition patient I mentioned said like the medical system, one of his comments was the medical system is evolving with me. And so, um, so, you know, we're trying to keep up with our patients in some ways. We want to be ahead, but sometimes we're just trying to catch up. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate being invited and having the opportunity to work.